news magazine of the screen. One of a series of educational records of our time. Contributed as a public service by the Detroit News, the home newspaper. the sandy wastes at Yucca Flat, Nevada, a new series of atomic explosions are set off. Tanks are among the obsolete pieces of army equipment being tested in the exercises called Operation Teapot. More than 9,000 servicemen have been assembled at the proving grounds, ready to take their places in forward trenches. In a grim new age of warfare, today's fighting men must be taught survival on an atomic battlefield. While the troops take cover, the Army's giant new 100-inch camera is pointed toward the blast tower. Men tensely eye the control booth as the seconds tick off. The familiar mushroom cloud snakes skyward, hurling the atom's deadly radiation high into the heavens. and shockwaves roll over the men huddled in the trenches. Never before have we had such a close-up view. Lighting up the desert skies for miles around, the fierce fireball flare is the signal for instant action. Quickly, the men are ordered to leave their positions. The explosion's radioactive fallout is almost as dangerous as the blast itself. In the vitally important precaution of dusting each other off, the lowly broom becomes an item of military significance. Next, Geiger counters are used to check the troops for signs of radioactivity. Marching out of the shadow of the atom's awesome might come fighting men, symbolizing America's determination to keep strong in a restless world. Nearing completion in a shipyard at Groton, Connecticut, is the world's first atomic-powered submarine, the SS Nautilus. Surrounded by scaffolding, the vessel has been under construction for more than a year. Now, workmen put the finishing touches on the hull of the submarine, slated to hit the water this year. An undersea giant built to circle the globe without refueling, the SS Nautilus launches a new era in the history of subsurface vessels. in Nevada prepare for an underground atomic explosion, the first ever photograph. As powerful as a thousand tons of TNT, this weapon reportedly can be carried by one man. Radioactive debris flies skyward from another underground explosion as a new weapon, the atomic satchel, joins America's arsenal. The Nautilus, first atomic submarine, launches a new era in naval history. Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower arrives for the ceremonies. The first lady, momentarily distracted, must swing quickly to christen the underseas giant. Majestically, the fabulous submarine slides down the ways. Built at a cost of $50 million, she will be able to circle the globe in 29 days without resurfacing on a few nuggets of uranium. Her torpedoes can be mounted with atomic warheads, and she can operate at depths which would crush the conventional submarine. The 300-foot, 3,000-ton Nautilus will also have a speed of better than 20 knots underwater. The age of atomic navies is born. The tower on which Britain will explode her second atom bomb rises stark above the Australian desert. Cameramen at the testing site wait tensely, then... Photographed from 13 miles away, the familiar atomic mushroom pours its deadly cloud of radioactive vapor toward the sky. 
Scientists term the test a complete success, another milestone in the atomic age. Within the last two years, more than 20 of these awesome blasts have echoed across the desolate Nevada desert. Interwoven throughout the story of the tests at Yucca Flats is a second story, the role played by the United States Air Force. Two Air Force sniffer planes haul the assignment of invading the atomic cloud to gather specimens of radioactive particles for analysis by nuclear scientists. The sniffers carry filter traps mounted on the wings and fuselage during their cloud sampling missions. Their crews do a job considered impossible a few years ago. Today, advanced techniques permit the men to stay inside the radioactive cloud for a time without harm. Other Air Force experiments probe the effects of the blinding atomic light on the eyes of aircraft crewmen. Many types of goggles and protective lenses are tested. The volunteers will look directly at the fierce fireball flare of the atomic burst. Quickly, the men turn to instruments which record the effects of the searing flash. The tests go on. Aircraft, some obsolete, some new, are staked out at various angles from the blast, for we must learn how to protect our fighters and bombers. Special cameras in slow motion record each fraction of a second as the aircraft disintegrate under the shattering impact of this powerful force for destruction. From these films, the Air Force adds new pages to its knowledge and mastery of atomic warfare. Now, at a closely guarded airstrip, the most dangerous mission of all is about to begin. A B-50 waits to be loaded. For security reasons, the screen must be partially blacked out as an atom bomb is raised into position under the eyes of the supervising engineer. In the plane, codenamed Rosebud, three men share a heavy responsibility. The pilot, the radar navigator, and the bombardier. The target is that X, six miles below. You're about to see the closest shot of an atom bomb blast yet released for public view. This is the story of America's ever-expanding atomic weapons program. This, within security limits, is the role played by the Air Force. Now, for civil defense, another realistic test is held. In a two-story house on Main and Elm Streets, a mannequin family waits, 3,500 feet from atomic destruction. They're lifeless dummies, but to the civil defense officials testing bomb shelters, they could help save lives. A second home stands a mile away. America is seeking through these drills to strengthen home front defenses, for their strength means our safety. Dozens of cars are on the streets of the ghost hamlet in Nevada. And marching to within two miles of the blast center, 1,500 GIs take cover in slit trenches, closer to an atomic explosion than any human being since Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Blinding flash silhouettes observers seven miles away. Then its ugly mushroom cloud swirls skyward. Within an hour, the dirt cake troops, all safe, have abandoned their foxholes and are pushing through a veil of dust as GIs pointing Geiger counters lead the way. 
The closest house is leveled by the blast, equal to 15,000 tons of TNT, but small as A-bombs go. The second building, 7,500 feet from the explosion, still stands. Although protected by every device known to atomic scientists, troops are unable to penetrate to the blast center for many hours because of the deadly radioactive contamination shrouding the area. Val Peterson, civil defense director, warns us to prepare, for this could be your house and your window. Here again, the atomic blast. 3,500 feet away, a split second later. Past one of the cars exposed to the atomic fury, a civil defense official finally is able to reach the rubble of the two-story house we just saw topple. Almost unbelievably, mannequins in the basement bomb shelter are found to be unharmed. The second house seems to have suffered comparatively minor damage. Windows have been blown in. All Americans must work together. For the stronger our home front defenses, the less the chance an atomic attack will come. is atomic energy. This is the force of 20th century man, a powerful force for destruction, a force that may be preventing a new world war. This too is atomic energy, harnessed by American scientific genius to benefit all mankind through dramatic new discoveries in industry and agriculture, biology and medicine. 10,000 scientists and engineers are at work to prove that atomic energy does not mean only the atomic bomb. The master slave manipulator at the Argonne National Laboratory, for example, makes possible important industrial research. Behind glass and concrete walls three feet thick, the operator is protected as he removes from its lead-shielded cask a container with a dangerously radioactive metal inside. The manipulator imitates the human hands in grasping, lifting, moving and turning objects. Here the container is placed below a saw. A switch is thrown and the saw bites into the metal. Intently now, the scientist watches the end of the container drop off. Next, the slave hands remove the tube and carefully shake out the radioactive metal for testing. The manipulator grasps the hot material and, directed by the scientist, places it under a hardness tester. A dial records the intensity of pressure. A microscope attachment enables study for industrial purposes of the effects of radioactivity on the hardness of metals. Strictest security safeguards America's atomic secrets. Every person working on a nuclear research project is intensively screened by the Atomic Energy Commission's protective force. And in the rugged areas where even the versatile Jeep cannot travel, mounted patrols ring atomic energy sites. At Los Alamos, amidst the wild, picturesque mountains of New Mexico, horses are of great value. The mounted patrolmen, through the use of radio, are regularly in contact with protective force headquarters in Los Alamos. Should a call for help be received, reinforcements could be dispatched by land or air in a matter of seconds. Day and night they ride, alert against spies and saboteurs. Giant anti-aircraft guns protect the Hanford Washington Atomic Energy Plant. Manned by carefully trained GIs, they guard against attack from the skies. At Hanford, biologists study the effects of radioactivity on fish, since Columbia River water is pumped through the plant. To safeguard Washington's flourishing fish industry, 25,000 trout and salmon are hatched each year and exposed to water contaminated with radioactivity. 
This is only one example of precautions that go on endlessly. In this case, there is not enough radioactivity to harm the fish or persons eating them. Hanford biologists are conducting similar experiments on sheep, feeding them pellets with radioactive ingredients. The paths of these substances are traced through the sheep's body. These experiments could be of tremendous importance to biologists and doctors, increasing their understanding of the processes of human life. In the field of agriculture, an isotope hothouse has been built at the Argonne Laboratory. Radioactive forms of plants are grown and examined under controlled safety conditions. Here a study is made of radioactive drugs which have been taken from the harvested plants. These drugs, which must be handled with gloves under a protective hood, undergo special analysis to determine how they can be most effectively employed by doctors in medical research. At the Oak Ridge National Laboratory's medical division, radioactive liquids are used by Atomic Energy Commission doctors in the fight against cancer, one of the dread diseases of mankind. Shielded by lead bricks, this solution, Gallium-72, is an important tool in cancer research. Here a patient at Oak Ridge drinks an atomic cocktail of radioactive iodine in solution and then is placed on an examination table. Next, a radiation counter with a pen attached is lowered into place. The radioactivity in the drink, which has settled in the patient's thyroid gland, puts the pen in motion drawing a picture of the diseased area. The light and dark pattern of the drawing reveals healthy and cancerous tissues, a milestone in cancer research. These are but a few of the countless peacetime uses of atomic energy. In the years ahead, the infinite power of the atom may provide the force to drive ships and planes, light our homes, and turn the wheels of American industry. And in the fields of agriculture, medicine, and biology, its future is unlimited. With the atomic bomb, American scientists unlocked the devastating might of the atom. Today they are engaged in the task of releasing atomic energy slowly, gradually, in ways of lasting benefit to a world at peace in the atomic age. Navy ship steamed in late 1952 toward Enuitok Atoll on a momentous mission. The world's first hydrogen bomb housed in this barn-like building was to be exploded on a tiny target island named Ilujaland. Strange secret testing devices had been set up to measure mankind's most fearsome weapon. While the task force cruised 50 miles from the doomed island, the seconds closer and closer to the first hydrogen blast on Earth. Minus 15 seconds. Minus 10 seconds. Niner, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, two. Watch the shock wave as it rolls toward the flagship. Extend boiling cloud surges to a height of 40,000 feet two minutes after zero. Ten minutes later, it is snaked skyward ten miles. Observers fly toward the target center. The islands surrounding Aluja Lab have been swept almost clean by the fireball flare, which enveloped an area three miles wide in the twinkling of an eye. Aluja Lab is gone, nothing there but a deep crater and water. From an island that once was, but is no more, out of an ugly mushroom cloud, mankind enters the hydrogen age, an era of danger, of challenge, of opportunity. Survival town Atom Test measured a model village in the Nevada desert against the awesome power of nuclear energy. Buildings of various materials went up. 
A million dollars worth of equipment was installed, including lifelike mannequins and tons of food to measure the contamination caused by radiation. The big dolls were survival town's sole inhabitants. Tanks took part in their first atomic maneuvers, some less than a mile away, the closest yet in any test. Nearly 6,000 persons participated, including troops sheltered by trenches. Many cameras in many locations filmed the single blast. Wreckage in the desert held vital information on how to survive an enemy attack. With Geiger counters to check the radiation, experts assessed the damage. An aluminum building was left a gaping wreck. Concrete or cinder blockhouses weathered the blast best. This one was less than a mile away. Survival Town's electric wires have become a twisted, tangled mass. Demonstrating the importance of civil defense preparedness, the elaborate exercises proved survival is possible, offering new hope to all who live in the shadow of the atomic age. This is one in a series of educators by the Detroit News, the home newspaper.